Welcome to the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies 2018 Distinguished Alumni Lecture. My name is Erin Corcoran, and I'm here this afternoon to welcome you today in both my capacity as the Executive Director of the Kroc Institute and on behalf of Asher Kaufman, the Director of the Institute, who is unable to be here today but sends his regrets and best wishes. At the Kroc Institute, we are constantly aware that the accomplishments and fascinating career paths of our alumni are a chief source of our pride. Since 1987, when the first four students were awarded a concentration in peace studies, the Kroc Institute has graduated over 1,600 alumni. This includes over 1,000 from the undergraduate major or minor in peace studies, over 600 alumni from the master's program, and as of this month, 16 from our doctoral program in peace studies. Now at work in over 70 countries around the world, Kroc alumni have found a variety of ways to integrate peace studies into their professional work over the last three decades. Some identify as professional peace builders, while others have found ways to incorporate the knowledge and values of peace studies into a variety of distinct professions, from religious leadership to teaching to parenting. The Kroc Institute's Distinguished Alumni Award honors graduates of Notre Dame's Peace Studies program, whose careers and lives exemplify the ideals of international peace building. In the past, we have honored human rights lawyers and advocates such as Chabi Aguirre at the International Criminal Court and Vienna Colucci of Amnesty International and Adriana uh, Quinos of UN Women, Ambassador Juana Popa of Romania, Chinese filmmaker Jin Li Yi, mediators and NGO leader George Wachira of NPI Africa, development innovator Molly Kinder, educator and activist Carsonia Wise Whitehead of Baltimore, African journalist Obi Anya Dike. To this list of distinguished alumni, we are now privileged to add Mai Mai Ni Ong, an entrepreneurial peace builder who has joined us from her home in Miramar. Um, but before I ask Ann Hainer, the director and lifeblood of our alumni program, to come up and introduce our honorary guest, I wanted to pause and thank those individuals who, without their efforts, this event would have not happened. Lisa Gingrich for making this event happen, including ordering food and arranging lodging and traveling. I also want to thank Betsy Carnes for just assisting with all the necessary paperwork and last minute details. Ellen Bowman Spingler for her indispensable to this effort, for she makes sure that all the bills are paid. <laughs> um, to our communications team, Hannah and Christy, I'm grateful for all of your efforts to make sure this event was widely publicized on various platforms, including social media. Finally, Andre, thank you for your tech support. Um, so please join me in welcoming Ann Hainer to introduce our guest speaker. <laughs> Greetings, we're so delighted that you can be here for this special occasion. Mining Yi Ong provides a great example of the diversity and interconnectedness of peace building work with overlapping projects ranging from sustainable development to education, cultural preservation, and environmental protection. A member of the Sumtu Chin community in Myanmar, Yi's career path was launched during a visit to London in 1998 when she found the opportunity to enroll in a program in international development at the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies. Returning home to Myanmar after this master's program, she obtained support for an oral history project in the Suntu community. And during the course of this project, realized that the intricate handwoven fabric for which her community was famous was no longer available. High poverty rates forced many Songtu people to sell their handwoven clothing to people beyond the community for income, and cheap, easily mass-produced clothing replaced the finer textiles for everyday wear in the community. Despite international interest in purchasing the textiles, many weavers in the community were forced to take on odd jobs to make ends meet and were living on the brink of poverty. And as traditional clothing vanished from local villages, the art and skill of weaving was not being passed on to younger generations. So what to do? My nini paired young women with older master weavers from the community who taught the time-consuming creative process of crafting handwoven textiles featuring traditional chin patterns on backstrap looms. During this time, political and ethnic tensions in Myanmar were increasing, and Nini realized that she needed to learn more about peace building as well. 
After exploring several options, her husband Kevin, a Notre Dame alum, conveniently, read news of the Kroc Institute's MA program, and that brought her to us. Shortly after launching her ambitious weaving project in the spring of 2002 in Myanmar, Nini left for Notre Dame to begin her MA program here, not knowing if her project could survive. However, fortuitous connections here at Notre Dame ended up being very key. She entered the Social Venture Plan competition, sponsored by Notre Dame's Mendoza School of Business, our first and I believe only peace student who's ever entered that competition, <laughs> and won and was awarded a special Overcoming All Odds award that provided both financial support and recognition. In addition, members of Notre Dame's boxing team were so inspired by Mainini's presentation during the contest that they also donated an additional $3,500 to support her work. These sources of support, along with the opportunity to, do, opportunity to display and sell weavings on campus, were key to allowing her business to survive. She was able to solicit additional grant funding and develop sustainable business opportunities, selling textiles to people across Myanmar and around the world who are willing to pay a fair price for the intricate pieces. In addition, her cultural preservation efforts have received funding from the National Geographic Society. Today, the Sewn Tube Project employs 270 weavers, all women, and supports 35 to 40 students pursuing education each year. Many students, she found, must leave their villages in order to attend high school. So some proceeds from the sale of the Sewn Tube textiles support the maintenance of a hostel that houses the students and provides them with food, lodging, health care, and support. And all of these projects may only be the beginning. Another of Nini's passions is environmental protection, so she's worked to encourage limitation of charcoal burning and restoration of bamboo forests. All of these important projects also take place in Rakhine State, where recent outbreaks of ethnic violence have led to a massive exodus of refugees. So she is acutely aware of the connection of development and education to violence prevention. As Nini notes, the weavings that Sewn Two women produce are tangible assets both culturally and economically, and aspects of culture, both tangible and intangible, have real and intrinsic value and can be one way to reduce poverty and discourage conflict. Nini today will address the topic, Weaving Peace in Myanmar, Sustainable Development and Cultural Preservation. I'd like to ask my Nini Ong to join me on the stage up here to receive the Kroc Institute's Distinguished Alumni Award. Do not pick up the award because it's in two pieces, <laughs> so the award will, will not be dropped. Uh, but the Kroc Institute Nini is proud to recognize your dedication to working for a more just and peaceful world through education, development, and cultural preservation, and to confer on you the Distinguished Alumni Award of the Kroc Institute. As inscribed on the base of the award, we are confident that you will go forth in peace. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Faculty members, students, and friends, it is an honor for me here to be here today and to accept this award. I have many fond memories of my time at Notre Dame, and specifically as a student at Croc Institute. While here, I make many friends that continue to this day. The opportunity to learn from Croc's distinguished professors, John Paul Lederet, George Lopez, Bob Johansson, Scott Appleby, David Colwright, and Cynthia Mahmoud. 
is something that I always cherish. Likewise, my classmates were a constant inspiration for me. Today, among those classmates, there are international lawyers, university professors, political activists, and leaders in the fight against corruption. As students, we exchanged stories, shared news, laughed and cried together, and a few of us even tried to ride bicycles in three feet of snow. <laughs> <laughs> it was here at Notre Dame that I realized I could turn what was a dream into a reality. Through a kind effort of Ann Hainer and other staff members at Croc, I was given permission to display and sell hand, some handmade weavings from my parents' village in Myanmar. At one of these sales, I met Professor Jim Faulkner, who was teaching at the Mendoza Business School. With his encouragement and the support of Croc faculty, staff, and my classmates, I realized that my passion to preserve the cultural heritage of my people could be transformed into a series of projects that preserve the heritage and tradition of my ethnic group while also providing employment for hundreds of illiterate women, education for children, and a path to sustainable development for marginalized Chin communities living in the second poorest state in Myanmar. Myanmar is the largest country in mainland South Asia. percent of the population practice Theravada Buddhism, and the government recognizes eight major ethnic groups and 135 subgroups. The largest of these groups, the Burma, make up about 68% of the population. I am Chin, and we make up approximately 2% of the population. Most Chin live in Chin state, although they can be found throughout the country. My Chin group, the Sumtu, live in Rakhine state. conflicts in Myanmar, it is important to keep in mind that the past explains the present and that all conflicts in Myanmar have an ethnic element to them. In 1947, minority groups along with the major, majority Burma groups signed the Penlong Agreement, a document which the minority ethnic groups believed encompassed a vision of how the new country was to be governed. This document laid the foundation for a future federal union. However, when the new constitution was written, the principles of this agreement were not realized. The years after independence were characterized by an uneasy political situation and sporadic internal conflicts. As a newly independent state, Myanmar faced significant social, economic, and ideological differences. By 1960, armed resurrections by ethnic nationalities were occurring throughout the country. Ethnic nationalists were demanding a federation and threatening to exercise the right of secession guaranteed in the 1947 constitution. While successive government has attempted to bring this violence under control, they have met with limited success. After the 1988 pro-democracy uprising, the government signed ceasefire agreements with approximately 25 insurgent groups. These agreements allowed the insurgent to keep their weapons, but ironically, the military government did little to acknowledge these groups politically, despite their winning a number of parliamentary seats in the 1990 election. As of today, over 30 ceasefire agreements have been signed, but 11 major groups still have not agreed to a ceasefire. Under today's government, the peace process in Myanmar continues 
but significant obstacles remain. These obstacles are more problematic and challenging than those faced by previous governments. The challenge is not simply resolving conflicts between the government and armed ethnic conflicts, but also must address the internal political tensions between the government branches themselves, that is between the army and democratically elected government. Another current constitution, the commander in chief of the military has the right to appoint 25% of the members of parliament. This means that democratically elected members of parliament cannot amend the constitution without military support. In addition, the commander in chief controls the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Border Affairs, and the Ministry of Home Affairs. This hybrid government of democratically elected representatives and the military coupled with inter-ethnic divisions poses enormous challenges for the current new government. Without bringing on board the remaining non-signatories to ceasefire agreements, an end to almost 70 years of armed conflict in Myanmar is most likely impossible. The current situation in Rakhine State is the most recent crisis facing Myanmar. And reveling it is well beyond my expertise and the limit time, the time limits of this presentation. However, a reference for anyone seeking information on Rakhine State is the report by Kofi Annan's Advisory Commission on Rakhine. The commission authorized by Don San Suu Kyi published its findings such as just as the viol current violence and humanitarian crisis began last August. The report is a comprehensive study on the issues of facing the diverse populations living in Rakhine. Its 88 recommendations reflect the best possible solution to the situation in Rakhine State. Any solution to the current crisis will take time and will involve compromises on all sides. But if peace, justice, and respect for basic human rights are to return to Rakhine, hard decisions must be taken. I would like to share a few short paragraphs from their report with you because they accurately describe where all my work are located. As with other conflicts in Myanmar, the roots of the current conflict and humanitarian crisis in Rakhine are complex and historically based. While it has all the components of other conflicts in Myanmar, it is significantly more complicated because it also involves religious differences and a population of over one million individuals who the government does not recognize as citizens. 
Here's the conclusion from the Kofi Annan report. Since the report was issued, the situation in Rakhine has not improved. Given this, you might ask, why would anyone want to have a business there? <laughs> For me, the answer was easy. I didn't have a choice. I was born in Rakhine State, and my chain group, the Sumtu, live in Rakhine State. The Sumtu make up less than 1% of Rakhine's population, and for decades, we had lived in peace with all the other ethnic groups. The villages where my weavers live and the town where Sumtu Weaving Center is located are just 50 miles from where the current conflict has occurred. Fortunately, we have not yet been directly affected by the violence, despite our proximity to several Rakhine and Rohingya villages. However, we are constantly fearful that the violence will spread and the and that Chin communities will be affected. Now for some better news. <laughs> Sorry, one photo is missing. <clears throat> Rakhine and Myanmar are not all about human rights violations. Entire communal conflict, civil war, poverty, and natural disasters. Throughout the country, there are traditions and ancient wisdom that we need to celebrate. Growing up in Rakhine State, I was fascinated by the ritual chants and the songs of the village elders. Their verses were often composed simultaneously while drinking traditional rice beer. My childhood memories of listening to songs by my great-grandmother and great-aunt, as well as my maternal grandfather were an inspiration to me and have had a profound impact on me. <clears throat> I was amazed how my uncle could focus the weather by looking at the sky and how the stars and moon told them of the changing seasons. They could steer their canoes through rapids and whirlpools by watching the waves and shoreline and they could find their way through a, a maze of small streams simply by observing the color of the water and the feel of the current. In Chinu communities, this wisdom was conveyed to successive generations by our elders and shamans. My grandfather was a famous shaman, and it is his legacy that I wanted to preserve when I started the Sumtu Cultural Preservation Project. Because the Sumtu language <coughs> is an oral language and does not have a written component, this wisdom was transmitted through songs and chants in an ancient ritual language. But as the years passed, the shaman grew older, and the language, stories, and the history of my people was in danger of being lost forever. I felt I had to do something. That was the beginning of the Suntu Culture Preservation Project. With funds from the Endangered Language Program, the preservation project documented our ritual language and recorded ritual performances. This was a time-consuming task because there is no written Suntu language or the terms have to be translated first into Burmese and then into English for archiving and academic purposes. <clears throat> Sometimes there are traditions that cannot be preserved. Change and modernizations are inevitable and much of this change is good. The tattoo faces of Chin women will soon become a thing of the past. 
Women are no longer having their faces tattooed, and I accept this. Fortunately, academics and professional photographers have traveled to the remote villages where the women live and recorded their stories. The women will pass away someday, but their artistry and their narratives will be preserved. Cruel and dangerous practices, as well as those that endanger the environment, have no place in today's world. They should come to an end, but they should not be erased from the history. They are part of a culture practiced and cherished by our ancestors, and such should be documented before they disappear completely. After our team interviewed and recorded the language of the last surviving shaman six years ago, he told me that I, I along with two of my staff members, could have been shaman. I never felt so proud, and I'm pleased to say that we can now understand much of this archaic language. Sadly, Ula Singh, the last surviving shaman, passed away in late 2015. <coughs> But his legacy, his language, and wisdom did not die with him. It lives in all Songtu people today. Our initial preservation work stimulated a lot of interest in the Songtu community. Members of the community spoke of old songs and language games they remembered, which are now revived in our Songtu culture. One game involves the light-hearted walking between parents-in-law performed in a dialogue of rhyming verse. Another game involves two participants exchanging insults, each trying to out-insult the other. <laughs> it was all done in good fun. Yeah. And it was especially pleasing to see the younger generation of Songdu speakers taking an interest in the language. One teenager even had a go at composing a rap song using archaic words and <laughs> phrases taken from Songtu ritual language. Because this language has, has been preserved, we can now revise Songtu terms and incorporate them into current Chin language. We are no longer dependent on using words from the Rakhine and majority Burma languages. Instead, these bold words can be replaced with archaic terms to improve modern or present Songtu <coughs> language. <clears throat> this month marks the 16th anniversary of the Songtu weaving project. Until 2002, only the older generation of women in my community were proficient in weaving complex traditional designs. As these women died, the information they carried with them was lost. Since the weaving project began, we have trained over 450 weavers and currently employ over 270 weavers across three different townships in Rakhine State. In addition, we have documented the names and history behind over 150 woven patterns unique to Chin culture. These are them. I began the project with my great aunts, who at that time were in their 70s and 80s. They then taught my aunt's generation, who were in their 40s and 50s. They in turn taught their daughters, who were in their 20s. We are now training the youngest generation, many of whom have just turned 18. 16 years ago, I must confess that I felt old working with women who two generations older than I was. Today working with a younger generation makes, makes me feel younger at heart. <laughs> but I cannot forget the strength, the inspiration these original weavers give me. Chin weavings are based on traditional patterns are produced using backstrap looms, as well as on floor looms, which we, we modify to accelerate the production. Our weavers <coughs> use backstrap looms for high-end pieces, such as ones for museum, collectors, and commission pieces. This is because the incredibly intricate design associated with some 
chin patterns can only be woven on backstrap looms. When a piece is woven, we want to recognize not only our heritage, but also the skills of our artisan weavers, so we never compromise on quality or change patterns to reduce cost. Even when using the modified floor looms, we maintain the highest standards, so the finished pieces are of superior quality. Today, soaked weavings are recognized as some of the finest produced in Myanmar. A milestone that we achieved last year was that we revived the previous lost art of weaving Sasijo, the sacred Buddhist art of tablet wo woven textual ribbons, which is unique to Myanmar. The last professional weaver of Sasijo died in 1984, but we now make these ribbons in the form of woven prayer bracelets with suitable text according to the wish of the customer. The weaving project has pr produced intangible results. Chin women are empowered, a component of our heritage has been preserved. Ancient lands are valued and kept within families, and a valuable art form has been saved. Chin communities now have a sense of Chin ethnic pride in a region where they are a better, where they are a minority, and perhaps most importantly, Chin communities now have hope for a better future. Previously, with little or no chance for employment in Rakhine State, young women left for other countries to become mates, and young men left to work overseas or in dangerous occupations like mining. Chin youth became easy targets for human traffickers, and many who left their communities ended up with shattered dreams. <clears throat> Intangible culture is often ignored by development agency in Myanmar. But it is essential if an ethnic minority group is to maintain its identity. It is crucial to survival. There is a sense of collective pride among the Songtu people today. This pride brings individuals together and is an effective way to reach the grassroots level of a community. If a community feels its identity and traditions are neglected or threatened, development agencies can use this sentiment as a catalyst to spark individuals into action and to encourage them to work together. Cultural heritage can serve as the thin edge of the wedge for introducing development activities into an area. Because preservation of culture depends on a steadily decreasing number of elders, community recognizing the importance of preservation belief. There is no time to waste in initiating such activities. This is what Songtu did with all our activities. We say to our elders, you don't want to take your wisdom to your grave, do you? Please share it with us. master weavers when I went to pick her up to make a <laughs> commission pieces. She handed down the money to her husband. <clears throat> an important outcome of the weaving project is an improved standard of living in the region, beset by poverty and under the constant threat of violent conflict. As you are aware, in most societies, once a woman brings money home, there is a balance of power. Here is one of my master weavers. She is 67 years old and has been with us for 16 years. She is the breadwinner of the family. She has purchased fishing nets for her husband and built houses for her son and daughters. She also pays school fees for her grandchildren and she now has better health care because of her income from weaving. 
although she is a master weaver and one of Sung Tu's highest paid employees. Her story is repeated for many of our weavers. <clears throat> a dramatic example of communities coming together is the Sung Tu Cup a soccer tournament held annually that involves a week of fun, food, and competition for co-ed teams from over 30 villages. So to recognize the event, sorry, so to organize the event in 2011. But since then, the winning village has been responsible for planning and hosting the tournament. This event has been the most successful community center project so to has ever done. Yet it required the last, the least investment. For this, I give credit to my classmate Ruth Hill from Northern Ireland, whose interest while here at Crop was building peace through sports. Part of the proceeds from weaving seals are used to support the Song to Education project. The education project provides a residential hostel in Mimbia for 35 to 40 children from remote Chin villages. Each year, the hostel provides housing facilities, food and tuition fees for children who must leave their remote villages to attend secondary school in Mimbia. I am proud to say that last year, the pass rate on met national matriculation exams for SOTU students exceeded both the Rakhine State and national averages. The education project is the best investment I ever made. All my current staff are graduates of the education program and have been with me for many years. The weaving endangered language documentation and education projects are the outcomes of the original SOTU project I started in 2002. My original vision was simple. Preservation of our culture and education of our youth will inspire future generations and create employment opportunities so that poverty can be reduced and living standards could improve. <clears throat> we soon too does not have millions of fundings, millions of dollars of funding like other development organizations in Myanmar. We do not fit into their criteria as they seek quantifiable results in a short time. Although we sell some of our products overseas, our main market is now inside Myanmar. Our high quality weavings are not cheap, but we take pride in paying our employees well. We do not market our pieces based on the fact that they are made by poor illiterate women in a conflict and cyclone prone area. Instead, we explain at great length the story behind our weavings and the techniques our artists use to produce them. Until about a year ago, we walked in three different Rakhine townships. But because of the current volatile situation, we suspended activities in a township which is six hour return trip from our office in Mindia. Traveling that distance through remote areas was too dangerous for my staff. Because new conflict can arise anywhere at any time, we now reduce our traveling from weekly village visits to monthly visits. Needless to say, this has affected the welfare of our weavers, not to mention a reduction in sold to revenue. Without a regular supply of our product, we cannot support our various projects. Any further violence that restricts our weavers' freedom to work will cause unemployment and the business will suffer. <clears throat> the 
The Song2 organization used Chin heritage as a foundation for development. We used this heritage to stimulate participation from the community. The success of the project lies in involving all locals, so the authorities and the community <coughs> itself are not seen as importing strangers into the region. In other words, establishing a positive relationship between staff, local partners, and our neighbors has made a significant difference in the success of our SOTU activities. If the community mobilizers do not understand local values and traditions, there is a potential for conflict, and essential relationships can be strained. Communities can, sorry, communities that earn their income based on regular trade and interaction among members are less likely to enter conflict. By improving the economy of Chin families and encouraging sustainable practices, communities are less willing to add to risk gains they have achieved by entering conflict or promoting civil unrest. For many, the recognition of minority and ethnic rights is seen as a matter of less urgency than the more encompassing issue of human rights. However, the priority of cultural rights within the realm of human rights must be considered for the mere fact that cultural rights are the most underdeveloped, yet at the same time, the most complex area of human rights. Many ethnic groups, such as the Chin in Myanmar, are so diverse that numerous subgroups do not have written languages. Instead, these groups rely on a traditional folk culture passed down from generation to generation, orally and through ritual ceremonies. The traditions of many minority groups in Myanmar are nearly extinct, and urgent action is needed to ensure the preservation of cultural heritage and traditional activities. With each day, more history is lost. For many minorities, the saying, an old man passing away is like losing a chapter of history, reflects a sad but accurate truth. The traditions of many ethnic groups are at significant risk, either through complete elimination or through slow assimilation and subsequent dilution by the dominant ethnic group. The outcomes of both events are the same, only the time frame differs. The ancient wisdom, arts, crafts, and folklore of our ancestors are disappearing rapidly. In conclusion, I ask you a final important question. Thank you for your attention, and uh, let's take a look at the short video which I made for National Geographic a ye few years ago. We received a small funding from National Geographic to produce this documentary. Sotu is a culture of memory. Our knowledge is passed along orally through songs and chanting. As children, we learn how to honor our ancestors. 
by speaking their names again and again and again. Some of our elders can name 40 generations of their lineage, going back hundreds of years. Our traditional weaving is preserved and passed along in this same way. Complex patterns are visualized and memorized so clearly that master weavers can still record individual patterns, even if they haven't woven them in decades. Five strings down, one string up, five strings down. That's the way it goes. The patterns can be intricate and complex, but this is how we weave the threads of our past into the present, with the hope that this will safeguard our future. Our traditions come from a time when our ancestors were isolated from outsiders. So to village life was insulated. Now there is changing. The outside world, based on written information and modern innovation, instead of oral tradition, is now open to us. We are interacting with other people and other cultures. We are learning new ways, but this may come at the expense of our own ways. My grandfather was a famous Zongdu shaman, but one day, he stopped performing ceremonies. He said, if we still practice our traditional ways, our people will continue to be illiterate. Myanmar is the largest country in mainland Southeast Asia, with almost 140 distinct ethnicities. The most diverse ethnic group is the Chin people, who are comprised of 53 subgroups. One of these subgroups, the Suntu, live in Mimja, Rakhine State at the mouth of the Pyunshi River. There is a low rate of literacy in Suntu villages, and young people are continually moving to more urban areas in our neighboring countries. As a traditionally oral culture, Suntu traditions are struggling to exist in a global environment that communicates with the written world. My name is Mai Nini Ao. I am Sung Tu Chin. For the past 13 years, my team and I have been dedicated to preserving Sung Tu Chin culture. In 2002, I was working on a project to record the ritual dancing of the Sung Tu. During a ritual performance, I saw something that made me very sad. The shaman's traditional dress was full of holes. We tried to find a replacement, but there were no complete sets of traditional clothing left. We discovered that those who used to make the traditional costume had stopped weaving entirely. It was too time consuming, and there was no economic incentive to continue this art form. Instead, the master weavers were chopping firewood making beds for roots and selling fish. Some were making bamboo baskets and fans. The weaving tradition was in danger of being lost entirely. I thought, if we could revive our weaving art, then we would have the traditional costumes needed for our rituals, and we could also create employment opportunities. After finishing the oral history project, I set up to create a weaving workshop for Sotu women. To prepare the workshop, I began to gather elderly soul to women. Many of them had not woven anything in over a decade. The traditional patterns and designs were in danger of being lost, and there was no written record of the art form. We went from village to village to try and collect old pieces to make an archive. 
Many of the Sumdu donated textiles and ritual objects they still had in their possession. But we still couldn't find any complete sets of traditional costumes. The patterns have been passed down over so many generations. A masterful textile art form has evolved. And this art form is created exclusively by illiterate women in our villages. These patterns show how Sumtu culture traditionally interprets the natural world. Some represent what makes us unique, and some display our history. They preserve our value as a people. We have patterns showing the footprint of a dog or bees drinking water. Others represent mangrove trees, cloves, female spiders, or fish eggs. Some patterns reflect other traditions of the Chin people, such as earplugs and tattoo faces. At that time, a lot of people came to our workshop, either to participate or to watch. It was all very exciting, and the villagers were eager to be involved. Many of my relatives and cousins left what you were doing to come help. During the workshop, the elders and the shamans told us what they could remember about their ritual clothing. And we set up to learn the basic textile patterns. We learned more than just weaving. Traditional songs were also shared. The young people had never heard them. They had no idea what the songs were based on or what beliefs they represented. I think weaving is one of the best professions. You deal with the beautiful colors every day, the beautiful patterns and textiles. When you see it firsthand, you have an appreciation. You can see that the weavers are happy, and you know there is a story there. We started with a dictionary containing 20 patterns at our first workshop, and now we have almost tripled that number. Hundreds of weavers have come through our trainings, and we will continue to grow. This is not a handicraft. This is an art form. These weavers, the Chin women, many of whom are illiterate, are keeping our identity alive through expressing our culture. They can make a living from their traditional skills. They can have a livelihood based on a traditional art, which is both economically and culturally sustainable. The backstrap of the loom connects us to our ethnic culture, and perhaps the threads of our textile can share our stories and connect us to the rest of the world. We face many difficulties and challenges. We do not know if the apprentice weavers will continue to weave. <laughs> Transportation is an issue. The villages are remote and difficult to get to. Some are ready to leave their villages to the past. It is difficult to maintain individual culture and identity in this modern world. If the weavers cannot make enough money, the culture fails. And our traditional art will vanish. Much of this art has been lost already. If this continues, our identity will disappear with it. This is why we are doing everything we can to preserve our indigenous textile tradition. For the past, the present, and the future of the Chin people.